that, huh? Younger yeah, younger children, are the, the middle age and the little kids go down. I'm going to ask that the teens stay up. Jason is not here today. Is, did I get that correct? Okay. But I want to give you these jokes. They're kind of cute. Bulletin bloopers. You like them, right? Yeah. <laughs> We've been talking a lot about food today. So this first one was in a bulletin. It said, the fasting and prayer conference includes meals. <laughs> I like this one. The sermon this morning, Jesus walks on water. The sermon this evening, searching for Jesus. <laughs> That's cute. Here's another one. Uh, this is a, in a bulletin. Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a, it's a chance to get rid of those things that are not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husbands. <laughs> I thought that was cute. Here's another one, bulletin blooper. A bean supper will be held on Tuesday evening in the church hall. Music will follow. <laughs> Some of you will get that later. <laughs> At the evening service tonight, uh, uh, the, the title of the sermon will be, What is Hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. <laughs> I thought they were cute. Anyhow. Uh, you know, I know I passed out the, the uh, thing that you have there. Uh, it's called Nine Prayer Language Parasites. And uh, Stoutful will get that far. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because a lot of times we think a word that when God gives you a word that it's always got to be someone standing up in a service and bringing forth the word. But I believe God gave me a word this morning uh, about what I call the number one parasite of all. It's the number one parasite of all. And uh, we need to understand something, guys. We are in a life and death fight. Amen? Now, now, if you're born again, and if you was to cease from existing in this body, you go straight to heaven. Amen? That's, a good, that's good news. But, but we're in a fight. We really are all the time. And, and, and I was thinking, what is faith? You know what faith really is? It's believing that God is good. Did you know that? Really, faith is nothing more. True Bible faith. We all have faith in something, okay? But true Bible faith is really just believing that God is good. And you know, you can't always look at your circumstances when they're not positive, amen? I know none of you have ever been through anything. The Bible says in John, Jesus said, John 16, 33, in this world you're going to have tribulation. Not from God. Amen? But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Amen. But I think the number one parasite is the attack on the goodness of God. You know, I've come to the conclusion, God is good all the time. Whether my circumstances, whether I've, they're going good or whether they're not going good. And really, and, and this goes right in line because this is the number one parasite, of, I believe, of the Christian walk. A lot of people harbor bitterness against God because they believe that God could have done something about their situation, but for some sovereign reason, He chose not to. That's a lie. That's a lie. God is always good, and God is always good to you. Amen. This is what I mean when I say we're in a war. I'm convinced that, that we, we don't understand the magnitude of the war. I mean, for example, in the charismatic movement, uh, of which we're a part, I'm a part, there's, there's a real emphasis on the goodness of God, which is wonderful. But sometimes we present an illusion that if you're going through, if you're, if you're really walking with God, you're just going to float through life and you're going to have bazillion dollars in your pocket all the time and you're never going to go through anything. That's a lie. It's a lie. Tell that to the Apostle Paul. <laughs> he went through all kinds of stuff. Now, the stuff wasn't from God. Amen. The stuff wasn't from God. And see, this is where the temptation comes in, is to blame God for the stuff that occurs in this broken world. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, that the whole world lies in wickedness. Amen. The whole system lies in the lap of the wicked one. We need to understand that. We are victorious. Amen. I got a message coming. I did it partially on a Thursday night. I'm going to talk about heaven. There's not enough talk about heaven. Yeah, heaven's in you. I agree with that. You're, if you're born again in your spirit, but guess what? Your body's in this broken world. And you will exit this body. See, a lot of people, <laughs> I heard Dwayne Sheriff say something real funny at the conference. You know, so every now and then this teaching comes around that you're never going to die. Who's ever heard of that? You're never going to physically die. 
And he goes, I asked the guy, who taught you that? He says, oh, so and so. Well, where are they at? They're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> you have an expiration date. Amen. Amen. You've already died in the eyes of God in the sense that you know, that you, his death was your death, etc., etc. But I'm telling you, you will shed this physical body unless the Lord physically returns first. You will. We need to get this stuff. I'll start here. I didn't mean to go here, but I will start here. <laughs> Hebrews chapter uh, 2, verses 14 and 15. And then uh, I just want to throw this at you, and then we'll actually get into where I believe we're going. I call this the number one parasite. And does, it, does this apply to prayer language, etc., etc.? It, it applies to everything. And I'm going to define parasite. I got another definition that's more descriptive, but... It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy or render unemployed or powerless him, the devil, that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Next verse. This is what I want you to see. And deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Wow. Think about that. This is why people are subject to bondage, the fear of death. Amen. I was listening to Dr. Jim Richards. If you haven't heard him, he's excellent. Uh, and he was talking about he's faced death a couple times. He had a, a kidney disease. He had different things going on in his life. Even he was born with it and uh, uh, different things that he's happened. He goes, when you face death, when you think you're going to cross over, all of a sudden all gaming is gone. You know, I've had a couple times where I thought, wow, you know, not to that degree, but all of a sudden you just love everybody. All of a sudden, you don't care what so-and-so said. You know, you start getting things in perspective and in, in focus. But you don't have to wait till you're facing death. Amen. That's not my message. But anyhow, uh, I just wanted to share that with you. I call this the number one parasite of all. Of all. And I want to give you this definition of, of parasite. I know there's one on your outline, and it's a good one too. But this is similar. Sim similar. Similar. That sounds like a rocket. Sim similar. Uh, parasites, uh, uh, we're talking about various forms of misunderstanding that attach themselves to the truth, truths that you believe or are considering for the purpose of reducing and ultimately terminating the life contained within those truths. Once again, the other week, I a couple weeks ago, I talked about what is a parasite. A parasite finds a healthy host you know this from biology class, and attaches to that host and doesn't kill that host, but just begins to weaken that host. Where, you know, they're always tired. They're all, you know, all this stuff begins to weaken that host and eventually can cost that host its life. But I define it, biblically speaking, a parasite, various forms of misunderstanding that attach themselves to the truths that you already believe or are considering. Amen? Like when we talk about the prayer language. Well, I'm considering that. I'm looking at the Word. Okay? For the purpose of reducing and ultimately terminating the life contained within those truths. How many of you know Jesus is the truth? Amen. But within the truth, there's multitudes of truths. Everybody got that? Has everybody got that? He is the truth, but within the truth is multitudes of truths. All right. Now, I call this the number one parasite of all. It's, it's a heart that doesn't acknowledge and receive that God is good. Now, oh, I believe God is good all the time. I mean, we all know how to do that. But what's your heart saying? Amen? I, can, I mental assent to all of it. I agree with it. But what's my heart saying? So that's what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3. It talks about if... if, if if your heart condemns you, you know your heart condemn, can condemn you? God is greater than your heart and knows all things. Amen? God is greater than your heart. Amen. So even if your heart's condemning you and causing you to be sin conscious and failure conscious and all those things, God is greater than your heart. Amen. So let me, let me, let me just share some things with you out of, I'm debating, I got three places to start here. But I'll just start with, we'll just start with Jane, or Romans chapter 1. Verse, or no, Romans chapter 6. That's the one I want. 
Romans chapter 6, and we'll look at verse 22. 23. That's what the 23. The last verse of that chapter. I want you to see this. Good stuff, people. Watch this. Most, most of you know this. For the wages of sin is death. Notice it's the wages of sin, not the wages from God. I'll say that again. If you're a believer, and this is written to believers, the wages of sin, I'm going to define sin here in a minute, because you think, you think I'm going to just say, yeah, I know, smoking and dipping and chewing, and that ain't what we're talking about. That's not what we're talking about. But the wages, plural, of sin, singular. In fact, the Greek says, for the wages of the sin, one sin. Now, there's all kinds of sins. You know, most of you know the definition of sin is to miss the mark, to come short of the glory of God, whatever you want to use. Amen? God has made you righteous. You know what righteous means? You want the definition of righteousness? The way it should be. You catch that? Righteousness is the way it should be. So when you're born again and you receive the life of God into your spirit, your spirit is the way it should be the way it was originally created. Amen. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 28, in the way of righteousness is sin. In other words, there's a way, there's a path of righteousness of the way it should be. Amen. Now watch this. It says, for the wages of the sin in the Greek is death. And what is death? Death, as defined by the Bible, is just absence of the presence of God. Amen. But... But the gift of God, I love that, the gift. Do you earn a gift or do you receive a gift? You receive a gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus, through, watch this, our Lord, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's big. But here's what's amazing. Eternal life is not just when you die. According to John chapter 17 and verse 3, this is life eternal. Here it is, guys. That they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That's eternal life. But here's what I want you to see. The wages of sin is death. Now the verse in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 23, the latter part of that verse says, that which is not faith is sin. So what's the sin he's talking about here? I believe it's the sin of not believing God's word, which is not believing God's good. Amen? See, your circumstances will scream at you and tell you God's not good. Well, they said, you know, I thought if I was, you know, really living for God, I wouldn't have any problems, that there wouldn't be any fight, that it would just be automatically happen. Who's ever had that mindset? I know I have. Nobody else, right? I've had that. I've had that where it seems like, man, it's like nobody else has anything, but I, I sure seem to be going through stuff. Amen. Jump over to James chapter 1, verse 13. I want you to see this. Watch this. And I'm going to give you some Greek here. I want to read something to you when I get there. Oh, this is good. Let no man say when he is tempted. Now, we think of temptation. What do we think of it as? Tempted to do something bad. And yet that's part of it. But the word tempted means tested or tried. Tested or tried. Let no man say when he's tempted, tested, or tried. Notice it said, the word say, lego. Don't even say it. That it's God. I'm going I'm to read that here in a minute. Don't even say God's putting this on me to teach me something. But yeah, you have churches teach it. Amen? And churches teach that God's sovereignly doing what he wants to do. You know what that does to you? That, that causes your heart to believe that God's really not good. And the wages of that sin, of not believing in the goodness of God, is death. Separation from God, because that which is not faith in the goodness of God is sin. Now watch this. Let no man say when he is tempted, tested, or tried, I am tempted, tested, or tried of God. For God cannot be tempted, tested, or tried with evil, neither does he tempt, test, or try any man. God doesn't do it. Amen? Amen. But see, the wages of that sin, of not believing in the goodness of God, this is why you got to go to the Word. 
Because when your circumstances are screaming at you, God's not good. How could Paul and Silas in jail with their backs bloodied, chained to the wall, how could they be praising God? God, we preached your word. We've seen a man healed. And now look at this. This is what we get. You know how? Because they, they knew the word. They knew Jesus. And they knew God's good and God didn't do this to us. See, we come up with these theologies. For example, we pray for someone to receive a healing and then they die. Well, it must not be God's will to heal every time. Anybody else you know what I'm talking about? We come up with this and, guess, and then guess what we say? It must have been from God or God must have allowed it. Hogwash. Hogwash. See, God is good. If every person you pray for drops over dead, God is still a healer. How do you know the word says it? See, this is, what we, this is what we're getting our hearts. Our hearts have to get in line with what we say we believe. And once our hearts get in line, that's when things happen. That's when, we have, that's when things can, God can manifest. But let's, I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know that? They were thrown in, in the, in the line, uh, fiery furnace, heated up, what, seven times? It was a bad situation. When they said, if you will bow, Nebuchadnezzar and says, and you will worship my image, and they said, listen, our God can deliver, our God will deliver, but even if he doesn't, we're not bound to you. My God can heal, my God does heal, he's already provided healing, but even if I don't see the manifestation in this life, God's still a healer, God's still good, and it doesn't matter because that's what he said. Amen. God is good, man. God is good all the time. God's not your problem. I find in my heart sometimes I still have a residue of this, this mindset that, that God is just, well, oh, come on, God. Can't you see how desperate and sincere I am? Come on, God. What's up with you? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, we see through a glass darkly. We, here's a heavy revy. We don't know everything. <laughs> but what we do know is it ain't God. Right. Amen. Amen. I love what Greg Moore says. He says, when we stand before the Lord... We're going to, and we're, when we see and we're known, even as we're known, there's going to be a lot of, oh, oh, now, I, now it's obvious why you couldn't get that one through. Oh, but it's not God. That's what I'm trying to stress here. It's not God. This is the number one parasite that it's attached to our heart belief, not our head belief. You know how I can tell it's not attached to our head belief? Let me do a test here. God is good. See, it's not attached to your head. It's your heart. That's what we're convincing. That's why it's so vital to, to take everything God's got to offer. I don't care. If it goes against everything I believe, I tell people all the time, I'm not interested in what I believe. I'm not interested in proving my point. I'm interested in the truth. Amen. Period. And you know what? It violates what I believe a lot. <laughs> That's why the Bible says, buy the truth, Proverbs 23, 23, and sell it not. Buy the truth. I counsel that you of, of, of me to buy gold tried in fire, Revelation 3.18. How do you buy something that's free? I've talked about this before. You know how you buy something that's free? You know what the currency is? Your current belief system. That truth's too expensive. That praying in the spirit stuff, that's too expensive. That goes against what my great granddaddy taught. That's way too expensive. I'm not going to give that much for that truth. Are you hearing me? You got to give up what the current belief system you have in order for truth to come. You can't fill up a, a, a glass bottle with something that's already, if it's already full, you, can't, you have to dump it out. <laughs> Is that too deep? If you want water in a Pepsi can, you got to dump the Pepsi out. Well, that's too much. That costs too much. I'm not going to pay that price. I never want to be like that. Never. I am, I am on a quest to know him. In an intimate, deep way. But you know what? It's causing a lot of stuff with me. I was, I was really coming to the conclusion. It doesn't matter what. God is good. And that's becoming a heart thing with me. It's getting rooted in my heart and it's changing my life. Even if I'm in pra praise God. We started a church, Lord, and man, it, things were going good. And then all of a sudden they threw me in jail because I preached the gospel. <laughs> That would hurt. <laughs> Amen. Help me, Lord, with the pain. But God's still good. All right. Let no man say when he is tempted, tested, or tried. Don't say it's God. Look at the next verse, please. Watch this. But every man's, when he is tempted, tested, or tried, uh, oh, but every man is tempted or tested and tried when he's drawn away 
of his own lust and enticed. Now stop. We think drawn away from our own lust is, well, you saw that girl and then you went for it. Well, that's one form of it. But you know, when you go through a trial, there's a temptation and a lust to try to explain it by saying it must be some sovereign purpose of God. So we start these doctrines because, hey, after all, if God was a blesser and a healer and all these things, then we, you wouldn't be going through this. Amen? I'm not going to compromise God's word just to fulfill my lust to have all the answers. Amen? Sometimes we have a lust to have all the answers. You got to be a pastor. You got to know everything. I, have, I don't know it, it is, is frequent with me because I don't know. You need to pray about this. I don't know how to pray. That's why we encourage you. Pray in the Spirit. I passed out a thing. Prayer, language, parasite. Satan hates that language. He hates you knowing about it and he wants you to think you believe it even though you hardly ever practice it. That's part of my, the parasite thing when we get in it. You, you, know what, you know what you believe? What you're doing. <laughs> You can tell what you believe by what you say and what you do. I can say I believe something. I can say I believe the Browns are going to win the Super Bowl. I know I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is the day of miracles. You know that. The Browns beat the Steelers. <laughs> we are living in the day of miracles. But anyhow, but you know, you can say something. I can say that I believe in... in uh, I don't know, going somewhere, I, I, it's my favorite food is to eat at a certain restaurant, but if I never eat there, I really don't believe it. You know, that, that's so simple, but it's amazing. What we really believe in our heart determines what we do. You know, I try to plead with you guys, I really do, because I know the importance of constantly hearing. I'm not talking about just at church, I'm talking about on a, a lifestyle that consistently hears the truth, because we are bombarded with lies. You want me to pick on one? Should I pick on Ebola? <laughs> I don't even, I didn't even know about it. Until someone put, I mean, I, that's how little I watch the news. There's a little, because it's packed full of unbelief. But one of the guys, Shepard Smith from Fox News, had a thing on and talked about how it's a political season. So the party in power wants to look like they're responsible. And the party that's not in power wants to make the other party look like they're not responsible. And that they would be responsible if they were elected. And so the media is blowing it up. Hey. Then you got some preachers coming on and say it's the judgment of God because America's been mean to Israel. Pure satanic hogwash. We're blessed because of Jesus. I'm telling you, it grieves me that this stuff is perpetrated in the name of God. God's already judged America. Now, we, we got to make good decisions. I agree with that because there's consequences of wrong decision. But I'm telling you, so much stuff we're hearing, we got a mixture. We believe some of the Bible, but mostly media, or maybe more of the Bible, but that, see, it'll mess you up. So much fear. Let me tell you something. Fear sells. You want to get rich financially? Just create a crisis. Remember global warming? How was that this summer? Oh, it's climate change now. Yeah. Hogwash. Hogwash. Now I know why Wigglesworth wouldn't even have a newspaper in his house. That's full of lies. I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't keep up on current events. I'm saying, but you've got to be careful because so much of it's jaded. We need the leading of God. There's so much fear out there. I mean, you guys, a lot of us got fears going on like crazy. And the reason we have fears is because we don't know God's good. I'm speaking to me. I'm talking about, I know it here, but does he, does he really, is he good? I know he's good to, to certain preachers, but is he good to me? This is where we live, guys. This is where we live. That's why I said, don't even say it, that it's God. But every man is tempted. When he's tempted to test right, he's drawn away of his own lust. It could be my lust to have all the answers. Listen to what drawn away means. It means to draw out. Metaphorically, it means to lure forth in hunting and fishing as game is lured from its hiding place. So man by lure is allured from the safety of self-restraint to sin. Wow. Lured from the safety of self-restraint, of the belief that God is good to begin to declare, well, maybe it's God. 
That's what I'm focusing because I believe this is the number one parasite. Amen? God, we, our hearts have to be convinced of how good God is. Now, look at the next verse. <clears throat> then when lust hath conceived. In other words, when something's conceived in, in a person's heart, like, like, like a, a, when a baby's conceived, when lust hath conceived, it brings forth or gives birth to sin. And I'm specifically talking about the sin that doesn't believe God's good. Now, when I say sin, I'm saying, oh, God's smacking you on the hand for that. I'm saying that which is not faith is sin. Faith in what? Faith in the fact and the reality that God is good and God is good all the time. Okay? That's what we're talking about. Then when this lust has conceived, this lust to have all the answers, this lust to, have, to make people think I got it all figured out, the lust to, to answer my own heart, to answer my own thing, I got to have some uh, uh, reason for this. Listen, when I look at the world and how fallen and broken the world is, it's amazing God gets anything through. It's amazing. That's the, you know, when we even talk about separating, I'm not saying you don't watch the news. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying you have got to watch what you consume. I, it's mind-boggling to me. I turn on stuff. There, I came back from Indianapolis yesterday, and boy, do I notice things. I was on I-70, and you come from Indianapolis, you know what I'm talking about, by Richmond there. There is more signs for Reed Hospital than you can shake a stick at. Big bucks, baby. Thank God for those things. But I'm telling you, it puts a mindset. Well, maybe, oh, wow. Maybe I do have something here. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Are you hearing what I'm trying to convey to you? This, the whole system is telling you. I mean, I, everywhere I go, there's get this, get that shot, get the, all, everywhere I go. Signs everywhere. They're all talking to you. you got to answer those things just like Jesus answered the fig tree. If you don't, they start lodging in your heart and then eventually they'll conceive. And if they're allowed to go long enough, they can do things in your life. We are the blessed of God. Amen. All right. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And we're talking about the sin that does not acknowledge that God is good. Let me deal, another one, deal with another one here. God cannot just do what He wants. That's big. Psalm 115 verse 16 says, The heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has He given to the sons of men. So God, the he, he gave the earth to people. Then when Adam sold out or committed high treason, He gave that right to the devil who became the God of this world. Then Jesus came as the last Adam 1 Corinthians 15, and all those who are in Christ, now we have authority to exercise dominion in this realm. But you know, as we speak now, there's still a lot of junk going on in this realm. Amen? We're in a fight, man. It's a good fight because we win, but I, but I tell you, I, I always like the Apostle Paul, why was he so intense? Preach the word, he says in 2 Timothy 4, 2. He actually, the Amplified Bible says, do not lose your sense of urgency. I'm thinking urgency. Man, Paul, chill out, dude. Life's good. Calm down. Have a seat. Drink a hot chocolate or something. I mean, get, get a grip here. But Paul understood the magnitude of what's going on. The whole world lies in wickedness. Do you, do you believe that? I mean, everything's got an agenda. <laughs> I'm telling you, it does. This is becoming a strong revelation to me. Listen, we are in the world, but we're not of it. We have to function in this system. I get it. I'm not minimizing that. But the way we function is what matters. Paul functioned in this system. Jesus functioned in this system. But you don't have to be of it. See, if we're not careful, those things attach themselves to, to us. When the Bible talks about the whore of Babylon, it's a false religious teaching. It says all nations, all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What's that talking about? Spiritual fornication. <clears throat> Having a form of godliness, but denying, contradicting, or saying no to the power thereof from such child of God, turn away from in your heart. 
That's what 2 Corinthians 6 says when he says, come out from among them and be ye separate. That doesn't mean you build a monastery somewhere and don't deal with life. That's, the con <laughs> That's a perversion of that. But it's a heart attitude where you don't allow those parasites to get on your heart and your understanding of the goodness of God. Wow, good stuff. Watch this. Then when lust hath conceived, now I'm, defined, I'm using one lust here. There's others, but I'm just using one. Lust is an intense desire, an intense desire to have everything figured out, an intense desire that my mind can still remain Lord. Did anybody hear that? Amen? An intense desire that my mind can still be in charge and remain Lord. When it has conceived, it'll give birth to the sin. The sin of denying that God is good in my heart, not my head. See, that's the deception. I heard, I think it was Dr. James Richards made a comment I thought was really good. He said, he said do a test on yourself. Just by yourself. Do, for example, say, by his stripes I'm healed. I just did it for myself. And you know, you're saying it and your head's agreeing with it, but what's your heart saying? What's your heart saying? Because that's what you really believe. Amen? God is good, people. But see, this is, this is do you, know, realize what, you realize what faith really is? Faith is convincing our heart, not our head. Faith, the walk of faith is convincing my heart that God is good to Chris. Oh, but this is going to, God, why? Why, do you, why, do you doing, why are you allowing this, Lord? Why are you letting this happen to me? See, if I adhere to that, the wages of that sin will ultimately allow this, that to run its course. Bring forth death. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Next verse. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Now stop. That's big. Everybody say this. Let's say it together. Do not err. My beloved brethren. Question. He's talking to brethren. Would you agree? He's talking to believers, right? And he tells believers not to err. That tells me that you and I as believers have the capacity to err. <laughs> Amen? He just got <clears throat> done saying, don't let anybody even say when they're tempted, tested, or tried that it's God. Once again, faith is believing in the goodness of God. Of God and that which is not faith is sin or to miss the mark of acknowledging that God is always good always good always good and everything <clears throat> like when I, I'll use an example when we I talk about praying in the spirit which your outline has bring it next week we might get to it because <laughs> uh, it's powerful but when I talk about that I tell I'm not it's not about me convincing you to believe like me it's about something you and I need to help us. Amen? Who needs help? Am I the only one? I need lots of it. So I want everything God's made available for me. I don't want to say, well, you know, that's all right, Lord. Uh, you can give me that 30-odd six. I'll just stick here with my little squirt gun. <laughs> I want the big gun. Amen? I want everything that God has made available. But see, a parasite will get alongside and say, well, we, I just don't, no, nah, I don't know about that. And it'll, it'll just, it'll cling to you. But anyhow, so do not err, my beloved brethren. I love how he says, my beloved brethren. Do not err. Next verse. Here's, what, what can we err about? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Stop. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Amen. And He doesn't vary from His goodness. Never, ever, ever. Amen. Back up to verse 16. Give me the Message Bible if we can have that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, my very dear friends, don't get thrown off course. Is there, can we get thrown off course? Yes. Doesn't mean we're not going to heaven. Doesn't mean we're not born again. 
Doesn't mean that. If you're born again, you're going to heaven. Amen? But there's more to this Christian walk than just living a number of years and dying and going to heaven. God would like to use you to take as many people with you as possible and help them to live an abundant life of knowing Him, even in this life. Hallelujah. You know why, you know why a lot of young people aren't interested in God? Because religion has made Him irrelevant. He's made Him irrelevant. You know, we say, oh yeah, that's, oh, we don't talk about that. God forbid that the church would talk about sex. See, I just stepped on some toes right there. God created it. Why don't we talk about it? That's oh, embarrassing. It is. Isn't it interesting Then the kids run out there to get their information? Because it's embarrassing. It's not embarrassing. It's of God. Man, that was good. Thank you, Holy Ghost. <laughs> so, my very dear friends, don't get thrown off course. Next verse. Every desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. The gifts are rivers of life, life cascading down from the Father of light. There is nothing deceitful in, in God. Nothing two-faced, nothing fickle. You know what that's saying? God's not two-faced. He's not good one time, and then all of a sudden he's bad another time because he's trying to teach you something. Let me tell you what God uses to teach you. The Holy Spirit empowering you in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to teach you. Amen? Now, I will agree, you can learn from bad circumstances, but there's a better way. Amen. Paul actually loosed people to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that their spirit would be saved. But that wasn't God teaching him. Are you hearing this? Praise God. The whole thing that I believe that God was really pressing upon me today, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prep for next week with Luke chapter 11, verse 5. Because that, that'll prep us for next week. This is, this is good. I, got, I actually got a couple minutes. That's awesome. But it really was coming to me strong this morning. Is how in my heart, I'm not fully acknowledging that God is good. Especially when my circumstances are screaming at me that maybe, maybe this, is not, this is not the goodness of God. I'm going through something. I'm going to tell you guys something. And this is a promise. Please don't put it on your refrigerator. And don't believe for it, because you don't have to believe for it. You're going to go through some stuff. And it's not all going to be positive. It's going to be a fight. See, the fight of faith, the good fight of faith, is to believe that God's good when your circumstances are not. Amen? Are you hearing this? I know the Lord wants this emphasized. Because there's people that, you got to burn the bridges on any belief that God isn't always good. Well, I prayed for them and, and they died. You don't know what they were believing. Are you saying they were a bad person, Chris? I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying for whatever reason it didn't happen. And I don't know. I see through a glass darkly. I know God's good. I know we released the power of God. I know we did everything we knew. God's still good. Every time I pray, the power of God's released. You know that? But it's not always received. Even sometimes when I pray for myself, I don't always receive it. <laughs> Amen. See, this is a hard issue. I don't believe we can go anywhere until we really begin to, to establish this in our heart, that God is good. I believe that that, that has to be so rooted. We've got to come at that from so many different angles because some people, you know why they get weary? Because they're just weary believing that God's good and they've just been through so much stuff. They've had so many prayers they've prayed for and they just haven't been answered the way they thought they should. You know, the Lord showed something to me recently. He says, when the scripture says, lean, trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not unto your own understanding. He said, so many times, uh, I use my wife and I as an example, we will pray about something and we will immediately start leaning to our own understanding of how it's going to manifest. Anybody else? We do it all the time. I thought, my, my, my. But we're getting better by the grace of God. We're growing, amen? And we're saying, Lord, we pray about it. We acknowledge you in this. We trust you. And we're not going to lean to our understanding. You know that takes all the pressure off? Yes. <laughs> all the pressure's off. I don't have to figure out how it's going to happen. Don't have to do it. That's God's deal. That's God's deal. I, told, I think I told this. I, I'll tell it again. But I think I said it last week. I look, Pastor Dwayne, he cracked me up. He said when he had this attitude, he come and the church was on fire. His son called him and said, Dad, the church is on fire. You need to get down. He stood in the parking lot and said, God, you got a problem. 
<laughs> he said, but Lord, don't worry. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. <laughs> you know, it's the kind of attitude we need to have, though. These are God's issues. And when her and I, I've noticed, you know, we, we, do the, we don't do it all the time, but we do it frequently. And we'll grab each other's hands and we'll just pray and say, Lord, let us meet who we're supposed to meet, not meet who we're not supposed to meet. You know all that. And then, it's, then we'll catch ourselves, or I do at least, I don't know about her, trying to figure out how God's going to do this. <laughs> not my job. That's what it means to not lean to your own understanding. See, it's all the, let me say this with me, say all the pressure, all the pressure. is off. You got a cat. That's what, just get it on him. That's where it needs to be. You can't figure it out. You don't have to figure it out. Amen. All right, we're just about done. Um, and he said unto them, which of you I, I, uh, shall have a friend, this is Jesus speaking, and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. Next verse. And a friend, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Next verse. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. Next verse. I say unto you, and then leave this verse up, please. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he shall rise and give him as many as he needeth. Look at verse 7 again, please. I want you to see verse 7. And he shall from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and the children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. Now, I've said this before, so I'm going to say it quick, okay? We always think we're the man outside pounding on the door. Under the old covenant, I believe that's how it was. But under the new covenant, you're the children with your father in bed. You're on the inside, okay? The, I believe he's, he, this, that's what he's teaching here. But I want to show you something. I'm saying this because I'm leading into... I've always stopped with verse 8. Now we're going to go to verse 9. Okay, go to verse 7 again. What he's doing, this is not Jesus teaching that you've got to keep badgering God to get your prayers answered. That's how religion has taught it, okay? That's not what he's teaching. This is actually not a comparison, but a contrast, like the unjust, or not a, uh, uh, yeah, it's a contrast, like the unjust judge. But here's what I want you to see. Go to verse 8. Uh, though because of his importunity or shamefacedness, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. Now, we've talked about this, but look at verse 9. Here's what I'm after. That's why I went so fast that it's on a CD from a while ago. And I say unto you, now stop. And is a conjunction. So he has not stopped the thought, okay? He's going to begin to talk about how God is in the new covenant. And he, and he, and he caps this off with talking about a friend that you and I have as a born-again child of God that lives on the inside of us. His name is the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now watch this. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given. You seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Next verse. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Isn't that awesome? That's simple. What if we just believed it that simple? Well, if you ask and you've been praying and reading your Bible enough and you've been nice to people and see we put all those qualifications on there that God's not putting on there that's why we don't receive it ain't about you <laughs> it ain't about you it's about him you're the beneficiary see but if it was about you the old covenant would have been good enough amen now watch this next verse and then he compared, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father will he give him a stone anybody no. Or if he shall ask a fish, will he give, get, for a fish, give, us, give him a serpent? No. Next verse. Or if he shall ask for an egg, will he offer, will he offer him a scorpion? I hope not. <laughs> Next verse. If ye then being evil now, of the fallen nature, watch this. This is a contrast. Just like when he talked about the children being with the father in, or, or being on the inside of the house with their father in bed. That's a contrast. This isn't a comparison. And he's contrasting saying, if human beings of the fallen nature can give good gifts unto their children, now watch this, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Do you see that? He's telling you, he's connecting that whole mindset uh, Matthew's account says good things. Do you know where good things come from? Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. 
And the Holy Spirit's the one that will convince you of the goodness of God. That's why we need the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Which I'm out of time. <laughs> Next week, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. <laughs> I, I really, I, I know I gave you the handout. I, I'm going to ask that you, do we have any extras left? Okay, no, any extras that, uh, in the, yeah, try to bring it because I'm going to, I'm going to talk about what I call prayer language parasites. And, and this is big because all these questions, people have these questions about praying in the Spirit. And, and so I'm going to try to systematically answer every one of them as best I can. I mean, there's, I know there's more. Don't get me wrong. I don't believe this is an exhaustive list. But my, my main goal today was to get across one thing. Everybody say this with me. God is good. Now, now stop, stop, stop. We're going we're gonna to practice here. God is good. I want you to just think about that. Look in your heart. We said that with our mouth. We all agree with that with our head. I, we're, we're, there's no, I don't believe any contradiction with anybody here. But what's your heart saying? I mean, is there some prayer in your life that I mean, it seems like you prayed and it just doesn't seem like it's going your way and you had an attitude against God? Am I the only one that's ever had an attitude against God? Anybody else? I have too. Because in my heart, before, before we shut down, is it, is, it, is it off? Is everything off? Okay, that's okay. No, that's okay. That's all right, Michael. Uh, once again, back to 1 John chapter 3, about verse 19 on down, he talks about if your heart condemns you, you know your heart will condemn you.